Hi everyone and welcome to an episode of Trident Talks. I'm Josh, the Recruitment Director here at Trident and today uh, very pleased to say we're joined by Mike Susong, Senior VP uh, of Intelligence at Garda World. Mike, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. You're very welcome. So Mike, um, please do give the audience, uh, I suppose, uh, as, as detailed as you like, a, a, a bit of an overview of kind of walk through your career please because I've looked at the U.S. Spy Museum. I've done some research on on uh, on your background. I've looked through your career, and it's uh, it's um, yeah, it's pretty uh, uh, intense. So, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a kind of walk through the journey from the U.S. Army and and, and forward, please. No, glad to. So, some would argue it was a misfit youth, but uh, but but glad to do so. I uh, <laughs> uh, went went through college uh, and uh, was uh, on an ROTC scholarship. So then I was commissioned the, the day after I graduated into the infantry. I'm proud to say, and uh, I had a career in the, in the military, reconnaissance platoon leader, company commander, uh, kind of the high points when you're a young officer, which, which I enjoyed a lot. I was branch transferred, at least it's a U.S. military term, to intelligence. They sent me back to graduate school in Washington. Uh, this was during the 80s, uh, during what we would call the Reagan Wars in Central America. So, you you know, as kind of the conventional army was plugging the full to gap in, uh, in Europe, uh, kind of the, the, the edge of the military and the opportunity, which I saw was uh, to kind of work in, in the special ops community. So I uh, was based in Central America, lived and worked in El Salvador during the, uh, during the insurgency and worked some with the counter narcotics programs in, in South America. Uh, came back to Fort Bragg, uh, became part of the Fort Bragg Mafia, if you will, which is the home of the Airborne, as well as the Special Operations Community. Uh, was active there, uh, Desert Storm, uh, Just Cause, which was the, the, the invasion or liberation of Panama, depends on which side of that story you're on. Um, and then at that time, I'd begin to work in parallel or right across the, the Central Intelligence Agency operations, you know, d despite what yep. the movies may say or the books may say, um, and, and, and transitioned uh, straight into, into, the, uh, into the agency as an operations officer. I was an operations officer for several years with, with the CIA, uh, lived and worked globally, uh, was... was privileged uh, to, to receive the intelligence star for valor uh, from the agency and then transition into the private sector, frankly. Uh, the kids were getting older. It was time to kind of, yep. kind of reestablish a, a, a home, if you will, and not the gypsy lifestyle and uh, move back to the States, went into the private sector. And initially, and this is kind of where our stories and, and yeah, yeah. interest to you and your community begins is, I went into uh, corporate intelligence, uh, and if you'll if you'll bear with me to give a little bit of history, because I think it's perfect yeah, to today, is uh, this was ninety nine two thousand prior to nine eleven, but just on the cusp, and uh, I was on the board of what is called strategic and competitive intelligence professionals. It's it's looking at strategy. It's using intelligence processes to help do assessment of a market, of a competitor, of a pricing strategy, of an acquisition, it, it's anything, but it's applying the governments, all the communities, intelligence practices uh, for business. Early on, and you think of this time now, it's two decades, and if you started talking about intelligence in a corporation, they always got a little twitchy because rightly or wrongly, it wasn't inculcated into business. And the first thought is espionage, you know, industrial espionage. That was always the first challenge. And I made it a policy when I worked with companies, one of my first trips was to the general counsel, to the attorneys, because I always joked is you don't want someone in the company to casually offhand mention to the general counsel that we have an intelligence function in, in the company now. So I would explain to them, and usually, quite frankly, 99 times out of 100, they understood the, the process, the society, which was the, kind of the industry association, had a very strict code of ethics, yeah. very far to the clear, bright line of what companies should or should not do. So that, that began to kind of inculcate intel into business, if you will, in the U.S. and Europe and elsewhere. 
So, you know, fast forward, I had several opportunities to work with big companies with a competitive intelligence program. Uh, then we fast forward up to about 2006, 2007, is when I had an opportunity to, uh, to co-found with John Waters in Dallas, Texas, uh, Eyesight Partners. So kind of take a pause there. If, uh, if there's anything in, in the, what I've covered you'd like me to expand on, otherwise we'll just kind of continue the no, journey. I think, yeah, it's quite a highly esteemed career, um, even, oh. even, to, even to 2006, right, and go backwards. And obviously, we'll come on to 26, sorry, 2006 to, to present, um, and we'll go into way more detail about eyesight um, with you and John. But um, yeah, I think did it did it just get to a point where in your in your life and career, obviously, you've been with the agency, you've been with the military, um, and you pretty much lived out of a black bag <laughs> most of your life, right? Uh, yeah. Like we all do in the military. Me and you are both ex-military, so I get that. Um, albeit you had a way more um, uh, uh, long longer career, but um, is that is that the reason why is it, you you moved on? Was it kids the kind of almost like you crossed paths in terms of life versus career? You've done it for for so many years. How, how long? So you spent twenty three years in the military and then another ten in. How long uh, you... well, all told, and I don't want anybody to do the math. Uh, it, it's really <laughs> uh, over four decades as an intelligence officer. If wow, you count okay. if you count reconnaissance platoon leader in the yeah, infantry, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's we, a form of yeah. <laughs> Could scooge it a little, uh, so it was. It's pretty much to date been been pretty much in the same number of years in the government and the private sector. Uh, and to, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm no, just going to say, and then once you moved on from uh, it, well, into the private sector, your career it just almost sounded like like where we're coming to the CTI, trying to embed CTI into the private sector, but go back and you're doing business intelligence and corporate intelligence. It's almost around. Um, trying to not persuade people, but to show people and demonstrate the value um, that uh, having a good, strong Intel team can provide to business, sort of, uh, to just, just generally, in, I suppose for them, increasing profit and loss, right? Uh, or, or just revenue, um, and being aware of the threat. Absolutely, you know, you, the terminology gets kind of passed yeah. back and forth between the government and the private sector. But if you, if you look at a CEO as a decision maker, you know, whether it's an ambassador or a CEO, they're trying to make better decisions. So mm -hmm. the Intel, function and CTI to help the CISO, to help the CIO, and, and, and if, especially if an organization is very cyber-centric, it's exactly what they need. And as we, we talk with our conversation, you know, we'll, we'll kind of talk on the, the overabundance of data or information and what, what challenge that is kind of presented to, to, yeah. to, the, to the community. Absolutely. So let's progress then. So EyeSight, you and John Waters set it up in, like you said, in, in Texas. Um, talk us through, uh, this is what I really want to go into detail because I know all the audience, the listeners, people, there are a lot of people in my community uh, or the community that I, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate to work in, um, especially in the UK and EMEA, that know EyeSight, of course they do. No FireEye and the, the work, the, the services, the products, the type of people and the business. But people, a lot of them are of a generation where they might not have been in the industry in 2006, 2010, 2015 even. Um, majority of them are serving in law enforcement or the military. So sure. please give us a, a journey. What was it like to set up a cyber threat intel business in a time when nobody knew what the hell that meant? <laughs> what, what, what was it like? And that's exactly kind of what it was. Uh, well, like I say, I, I'd had the luxury, if you will, of been in the corporate intel, however broadly you wanted to find that for a few years. Yeah. So I kind of felt like what, and in fact, I'll give myself a tiny bit of credit. I think that's one reason that John and I partnered and, and the core team is I had been in the intel side in corporations and John had been an investor and, and, and still is very active. And he was looking at opportunity like good entrepreneurs do. Yeah. And other team members that joined us had been in the defense industrial base and come from a from an IT security background. So it all kind of coalesced to, to, for us to, you say, kind of put a stake in the ground and see if cyber threat intelligence at that time, it wasn't even a phrase, mm -hmm. uh, you know, had, had, a, had a runway in front of it. I, and I'll give a few data points and I don't think I'll garble it, but it, it gives a good characterization of this. Yeah. And, and it kind of lines up in 2007, and I'll uh, apologize to our international uh, community as far as speaking about U.S. intelligence estimates. Uh, but the U.S. intelligence estimate that the intelligence community does to the president and the decision makers every year is kind of a, 
state of the world, if you will, you know, threats and risk. 2007, cyber wasn't in it. 2009, I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure somebody can fact check me on this. 2009, it was on page 34 of 45 pages, right after an assessment of West Africa drug trafficking. That's 2009. So we're, this is you know, two years into this company we thought was a brilliant idea, right? 2012, fast forward to uh, 2012, Secretary Defense Panetta uh, then says, you know, the country is really at a risk of a cyber Pearl Harbor, that, that our infrastructure is exposed and vulnerable to cyber threats. So if you look at that, in five years' time, it went from not really a word, you know, cyber being discussed within the intelligence community or within the, the community at large, to five years later, the Secretary of Defense, in very strong terms, you know, draws a comparison to, to um, to Pearl Harbor, you know, the, 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 in the in advent of the U.S. entering World War II. So things move quickly. I'll put a comma there is we, we were not that brilliant in that was we started EyeSight and we looked at the financial community as kind of our initial target customer because, as, you know, as the bank robbers say, that's where the money is. As the cyber robbers say, that's where the money is. Uh, there was a crash, you know, in 2008 and nine was the financial yeah, yeah. So we kind of had to tighten our belts, use that time to make our product stronger, to mm -hmm. war game what we were doing, to draw in the analysts and the skill sets that we would need, uh, you know, and just gritted our teeth until the market started to recover. And remember, this is also the time, same time cyber is becoming a thing. Uh, and 20, you know, when I said 12, uh, it's, uh, it is a thing, and, um, and companies started to really think, think about it and be, be, uh, uh, be serious about it. Uh, mm. I, I can't draw the line, but I would also suggest that CISOs as a role, probably if, you, if somebody did the tracking, they, they probably had a similar trajectory as tools yeah. and the techniques that an organization could use to protect itself begin to evolve and there's better authorities on me on all the, the tools and capabilities that are now out on the marketplace that it's, it's a full-time job, you know, and it's yeah. a key role. Did, did you, uh, and we're only up to 2012 here, but did you in that time, in the six years, you had the biggest financial crash pretty much since the, uh, since the twenties, right? Uh, since the 1920s, right? The Wall, the, the Wall Street uh, stock market mm -hmm. crash. You must have, you guys must have got around to the table and gone, what are we doing? Like, is, is this going to work? Is, and it almost must have been a bit of a blessing in disguise as well, because you, I'm sure there wasn't many customers looking to buy CTI services, right? That's probably the last thing on their mind. So it gave you an opportunity to, like you said, develop your product, war game your product, test it, make sure uh, it, it works. And, and, and just a lot of like round table thinking. Was there a time though when you thought, Jesus, like, we're, what, are we swimming against the tide here? Uh, you know, you always, I've got an entrepreneurial spirit like, like John yeah. does. With, a, with an entrepreneur, and I'm sure you can appreciate this too, in your, in your role is you have to have an unwavering belief in your idea, yeah. but you yep. can't yep. be blind, blinded by your idea. So there's yep. that, that place in between that you can't say, oh, it's too hard. We're just going to throw in the towel. But then you have to keep looking at saying, what can we do better? So that's, that's what we use for the time. We, we then begin to look at where, you know, critical infrastructure, maybe if not, banks was their opportunity with government. Also, this is a time that the ISACs, if you're familiar with the U.S. concept, yeah. the Information Sharing and Analysis Centers, I think that's what it's referred to, mm -hmm. is on the 17 critical infrastructure pillars. So those were government and government civilian partnerships. And so we started to work into those uh, as, another, uh, as another market sector, if you will. So that, that was a healthy way to to kind of yeah. kind of testing testing our product and our brand and it evolves. Any good company evolves, as I say now and always have. Is I like the customer to tell us we're doing well. It does us most more good when they tell us we could do something better. Yeah. You know, everybody likes the compliment, but it's like you know this is what the product needs to do for us, or this capability is something that would make a difference. That I can do something with that. Yeah. Yeah. Just being told you're right all the time. You're not going to continue to grow and, and develop and 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 keep you on your toes, right? Being told that actually, if your product could do this as well, uh, and that's what I think also is, is how customer success managers have been born. It's traditionally your account manager, right? Now it's just CSM, 
which is even, it goes one step further around, they deal with the product teams, the software developers, the sales guys, the girls, um, and to continuously improve the product. Yeah, and, and good, good CSMs are advocates for the client. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know, I have been, with, in joke sometime with, the, with CSM team there or other places is they're kind of your, your customer, their nightmare customer, because when, they, when the client wants something, they say, here's what it needs to do. Uh, there's kind of no place to hide because they know the organization, you know, the, the vendor yeah. can't say, well, we can't do that. It's like, well, of course we can because I was in the product review meeting last week. And yeah. On the roadmap. <laughs> Whose team are you on? <laughs> exactly. I want to, you just need to move it up. But then, mm. you know, then the business discussion is because, as you know, is every product roadmap and every, every client has a request and every customer has to, a client, rather every vendor has to then design a product to meet all our customers' need. That's yeah. another risk, and then we were guilty of it, but any company is, is the loudest client in the room or the biggest client in the room can start to steer your product and your services in a direction. If that biggest client in the room is making you scale and making your product more robust, then that's mm -hmm. a good thing. If it's just yeah. because they wanted to do a certain thing, are the intel to be shaped a certain way and it starts to island off what you can do for your broader client community you have to you know as best you can you have to kind of resist that so sometimes yeah. you'll see products on the marketplace or companies that you can almost see kind of what their client base was or yeah. kind of where they're targeting because it, it kind of has that feel I'm not saying that that's wrong but you, you can kind of see how that steers a, steers a bit yeah. Yeah, I, I can think of some examples now. Um, were there any um, kind of aha moments or light bulb moments where you guys went, we're onto something here? Uh, was it a big customer win? Was it recognition in a, a, a press release or a media? Or was it someone that's quite influential in the industry when you guys are onto something? Was there any of those moments where you went, wow, like we're, we're on this curve and we're, we're doing well? Yeah, and I would think of a few times and, and certainly be respectful of our, of our clients and I'll, yeah, I'll of speak, speak of them anonymously, but they were uh, a few big clients who had faith in us, you know, took a chance on us, if you will, yeah. uh, and they, they gave us both you know, the operating capital and the, the chance to deliver a product to a real customer. Uh, so that, you know, that was early on. I can, you know, think of a handful of clients who, who had faith in us and, and you know, I, I believe we delivered. Uh, at the same time, to your point, the aha moment is when we had talked about vulnerability assessments. You know, we use all the terms that are still common now in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. But then you started seeing at RSA or in papers, CTI, yeah. you know, cyber threat intelligence. That's, that, that's when you knew, okay, this is getting some traction and you saw competitors or you saw uh, parallel vendors uh, and again, any companies I name is not a is not a critique or assessment, but just to give some structure, we looked at like uh, IBM Q Radar or Splunk, who were who are platforms, and you saw them speaking about cyber threat intelligence or how they were agnostic and could ingest, you know, if not by name, iSight partners, but could ingest. Uh, you know, at, well, sometimes they called it attribution, you know, sometimes they called it TTPs, yep. sometimes they called it uh, vulnerability, you know, uh, IOCs, whatever, but they were starting to talk about what we, we created mm -hmm. and delivered to our clients. Then you, that's when you kind of felt like, okay, this has got some legs. Uh, and I'm, I'll give ourselves credit, sometimes it's luck, not, not credit, that we always built what we built to be I, you know, I use the phrase atomized. It's pieces that, that the company could use however they need. If it's all like one, if it's a PDF file, God forbid, or if it's one big database that you have to ingest the whole thing, different clients have different needs and different mm -hmm. vendor partners need to ingest it a certain way. So, you know, in essence, now we would just talk about an API. Yeah. Uh, but, but the, the thought was, is let's don't make this thing too monolithic, whether it's IOCs, whether it's TTPs, whether it's an assessment of a group for attribution, uh, whether, it's revert, whether it's malware analysis and, you know, the detailed analysis of how it functions inside the network, make it consumable. So, so one of your early points, how can the clients ingest this? It must be interesting as well to be at these big 
events and conferences, right? The RSAs, the Black Hats of the world and stuff, and to be there and these, these big vendors uh, are talking about CTI, you're there thinking, wow, like they're almost selling us for, like they're, they're kind of selling, because there wasn't many other providers at the time, right? So it's, it's, if any, I don't know, but um, it's like, the more they talk about it, the better it is for us. Because then all, all eyes just kind of turn around to us and, and people are like, oh, you guys do CTI. And you're like, yeah, it, it's a win-win. Yeah, no, it was. And as you market it and the competition is healthy, then you, again, you saw other companies adopting CTI, uh, yep. you know, sprays. And, and as it always happens, it causes some confusion in the market. And we were always a good and ethical competitor. So when you would talk to a client and they would say, Company X does CTI, mm-hmm. We were always careful to say, well, let's describe what we do. We, you know, we would never say, no, they don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, they were maybe repackaging something that maybe in the purest definition wasn't CTI. But that, you, don't, you never do any good with a client or a partner or the industry for, for diminishing your competition. It, I mean, that's just the fundamental belief to me is clients will make a decision. And at times, the competitor is better for them, yeah. and you have to accept that. It's a, it's a pill to swallow, yeah, and you develop your product to keep up um, yeah, or your service. Yeah, yeah. So, so to your point, yeah, it was gratifying that at the same time, it kind of, you know, whereas early in the days, we were the, you know, the bell of the ball. Yeah. Uh, and, and then as it, as it suddenly became a thing, you kind of get l- – lost if you will or lost in the wash of everything noise, like, the noise, great yeah. we got just what we wanted <laughs> yeah yeah now we have to market and compete <laughs> yeah but if, if you are the like we're trying to do the same thing at trident right uh, and i'm not trying to plug anything but uh, we just released the uk market report for threat intel i'll share it with you after uh, but it's the first one of its kind all around employment throughout the uk uh backgrounds and 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 titles and things like that um but the point is that there is no other recruitment consultancy or, or firm that are doing just only CTI, like what we do. So it's kind of uh, trying to set the, the tone of, of how we go about doing it uh, before it's even been do- begun, almost. Um, because still in the UK and, and the EMEA, across EMEA, in the private sector, CTI is still relatively early and junior and infant, um, probably five, six years old, um, a little bit longer. But I know full well that give it a few more years, if we keep doing what we're doing and making noise, people will jump on the bandwagon um, and then it's about, right, okay, there's a lot of noise now, let's not get lost and let's continue to improve um, so we stay ahead. Uh, no, absolutely. And I think you guys are exactly the right place in that regard. And always when people say behind or ahead, I'm always a little defensive of the rest of the world. The U.S. wasn't ahead as such, but maybe just the necessity of the size of the markets yeah, uh, maybe. drove it to happen sooner. So, it, it, you know, I'll categorically say it's not a matter of, yeah. maturity or, or culture or intellect or anything like that it just it, it had to happen there was just so much kind of in the balance that it got it got accelerated there but yeah. you see it in your market and you see it around the world it's 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 a thing that, that's that's being embraced quite seriously yeah yeah absolutely it's now in, i think it's now in necessity uh, it's not an afterthought of budgets or anything like that yeah tell me through through this journey of uh, eyesight what 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 your biggest challenges what was it I can assume, and again, I might be wrong, uh, it is the consumption from the end user, being able to utilize the, the, the service and products that you're offering, and especially when it comes to renewals. What were the biggest hurdles that you had to overcome? Uh, to your point earlier, which, which is about uh, the clients consuming the intelligence, let's, let's start with that one. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, intelligence as a thing was new to, to a corporation, and Let's say the corporation's a, uh, you know, a, a credit card company. Just use that as, a, as, a, as an example. They're very good at processing transactions and speed and security and, and branding because you could argue plastic is plastic is plastic. So that's what they do. And when you say, uh, okay, here's your, here's your kilo of intelligence, even if it's a mature ISO, a CISO program, and I think I'd say they've got the, net flows and they have the endpoint protection and they have, you know, their, their InSOC and they have to have kind of the basic tools of a, of a good IT security program. It's like, uh, okay, what do I do with this? Yeah. You know, so part of it was, and, and I think it's critical that the, whether it's the sales engineers or the customer success representative, somebody is their Sherpa, usher them through how to, how to ingest it, how to use it. Uh, and help, I mean, it, 
I'll, I'll, I'll betray a few prejudices here, gentle prejudices. Uh, and I love the community and it's been, it's been good to me and I still stay embraced with it is sometimes this community are the smartest guys in the room, truly, or they believe it to be so. So when you give them the, the kilo of intelligence, sometimes they're reluctant to say, boy, I know NetFlow, I know, you know, but I know patching, I know kind of the whole security suite in the corporation. I'm not sure what the hell to do with this. So yeah. they're a little reluctant to ask. So the way is to kind of talk them through it, give them some examples, get into their network along beside them and say, oh, here, if you use these IOCs uh, when you're doing an update or here we pushed out a patch or when you push out your patch or whatever it may be, or here's, here's what the look for in your, in your, in your network. Uh, it, it, it helps. And then, they got, then when they get it, they usually embrace it quite fully. If, if you have a client that has a hunter, you know, you call them a different name, but like a, threat hunting team, you know, that's yep. their job is to constantly be in the network looking for this, that. They're usually a good place to land this because when you talk, start talking about the indicators, mm -hmm. uh, they're like, ah, we get it. Maybe if you're talking to the, the network ops guys or depends on how you organize the guys who do the, the patching, it, they, they may or may not, you know what I'm saying? You, so you kind of find the pay, place in the organization where they, where they can get it and then you, and then you start there. So. Yeah. Any other challenges that you, other than, because that's a big education piece, right? That was. It never um, stops. What I, what I discovered is it never stops because you get that, that guy or gal uh, on board and, the, and they get it and they're running with it and they're good consumers of the product and they give you good feedback and then their role changes mm, or the new yeah. CISO comes in and there's a new emphasis, right or wrong, that's not a judgment. And so then it's the new guy uh, is, is responsible for the cyber threat intelligence product or program. And then you just do it again. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's any business. You just have to constantly be, be engaged with. Absolutely. So let's fast forward then. So 2012, right? Uh, 2016 was the year um, iSight was acquired by FireEye. Um, and, and it's very well publicly or it's widely uh, uh, publicized. Talk Tell us about the lead up to that. How did it happen? How did it come about? What did you have to do? Uh, you know, you, you kind of spoke to it early on as far as when CTI became a thing. Then, you know, then the market was looking at it more uh, holistically. Uh, it was a piece, you know, all those things are in the security stack in, a, in an organization. CTI was one of those. Yep. Uh, so then as, as it becomes one of those, then... Uh, acquirers or partners, you know, begin to, to kind of come to the surface because you're legit and the market's told them it's legit. Mm -hmm. You've got a track record at that time from 2007, one of the longer track records. There were, there were other players in the community, but uh, I, would, I would put us as, as one of the, uh, the preeminent ones. Uh, and then, then we looked to, to find a partner, an acquirer, if you will, who would, you know, I'll be quite frank about it, who would respect what we had built, mm -hmm. not because it was our baby. You know, you, you, you know somebody, you want to, it's like your kids going to school. You want them to kind of yeah. leave the nest and flourish. But we also wanted somebody that would appreciate what we had put together, frankly, because the people who had joined iSight in the early days and I joined iSight all along had put their faith in us that we would do the right thing by them, you know, for the, for the company and the client and their career. So we weren't, we were not going to just sell it to someone who would then pick it apart yeah. or keep, keep this piece and say, well, we don't really need that. So to find a partner who had a strategy and had a suite that, that the CTI would, would plug directly into was, was, you know, kind of how the marriage came about with, uh, with, with fire. So it was, it was a healthy place. Um, I think for, for all involved. So, you know. I, yeah, I think uh, um, what gets lost in, in these acquisitions is uh, many people think about the, the person or, or the organization buying a company and it's uh, and about their requirements. But a, bit, a lot of big people, I suppose, a bit like recruitment, right? It's candidate and client. Everyone thinks it's what the client wants. And if you think now the client is the, uh, the acquirer, people don't actually always pay respects to actually you guys might not want to sell to that buyer because they don't respect the product. They are going to tear it apart. They're going to make everyone redundant. They're going to, uh, and there's lots of moving pieces, right? So you've got to also as a team choose actually who, who's going to be best for this company moving forward. Yeah. And, and, and that was a kid. I think it was, it was certainly a healthy, 
uh, acquisition on, yeah. on our part and, and, and FireEye's part. And I uh, would, would be remiss to, to not mention, if not by name, by many people who were in eyesight over the years yeah. who have who've spawned their own company, who have gone to have significant roles in organizations. And I don't take any credit for it, but I'm glad that there was an eyesight and we were early in the days and they could learn some skills and if nothing else, they saw my bad habits and didn't repeat them. Uh, so I think it has spawned, you know, another generation, if you will, within CTI. And, and, and the guys are yeah. doing it and the women are doing it are doing, you know, above and beyond what I cited. So I'm happy to see that. Yeah, it's awesome. It's, it pays tribute to the, to the culture back in the day at iSight. And also it's almost like a mini iSight alumni um, that have kind of gone out there and, uh, and then they're now the future generations and building the CTI world that we know now. Uh, it's really, really cool. And, and you know, as I always say, younger, faster, smarter. I'm, I'm glad to see you and, and, and peers out there, you know, handling yeah. the next generation for, uh, yeah. for, for CTI. Awesome. Okay, so talk to us about post eyesight days. What, what, what happened? Um, talk to us about your role now at Garda World. Um, sure. Be awesome. What, what's now? What, what's the Mike Susung of 2020 look like? <laughs> well, <laughs> a, a little older. I'm not sure much wiser. <laughs> uh, but uh, interestingly enough, after eyesight, uh, uh, for a while, I thought, well, I just won't, you know, I'll take a break. Uh, yeah. and I uh, live in the hills of East Tennessee up in the mountains and uh, nice. got into my head to build bamboo fly fishing rods by hand. So okay. that, <laughs> that, that was enjoyable and still is. But uh, I realized it was just, you know, I was looking for, you know, as an old soldier, I was just looking for a new mission. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I kind of still wanted to be, uh, be in the hunt. And so I give you a few names. iJet, which was the original company where I'm at now, had been around about 16 years, one of the early geopolitical risk companies. Mm -hmm. They started in 99. So if you look at kind of what I mentioned about 99, 2000, Intel yep. as a subject with inside corporations was starting to get traction. Well, iJet, same time period, was looking at it from the geopolitical risk side. So if you, you know, if you look at two sides of a coin, they're not, bad analogy. But if you've got cyber on one side and geopolitical on the other, this was a good compliment. So I've known the founder here of, of iJet. Uh, so after FireEye, it was an opportunity for me to work with him and work with the Intel, the, the, the Intel team here. So I migrated over to, uh, to iJet, which is now Garda World, uh, and we have ballpark of 125 intelligence analysts around the world, mm. and they do geopolitical risk. So they do everything but cyber, <laughs> uh, but the same, same way, make it digestible for their clients, mm -hmm. uh, look at things that make a difference to a, to a decision maker, and, uh, and stay, you know, stay up on current events. So it's, it's in, in that sense, my role is very similar to what I did at iSight. Because I was yeah. not the smartest IT security guy in the room by far. It's uh, what we would consider as traditional intelligence, right? Geopolitical, um, no. even geospatial. Yeah, that kind of intel. Um, yeah, yeah, awesome. Okay, nice. What do you believe? Uh, I'm guessing, do you still keep your kind of hand in the CTI world still? You still uh, uh, you got uh, Yeah, on, on the periphery, yes, I do. Like I say, not as current because I don't do it day in and day out, but I definitely yeah. stay engaged with it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what do you believe the future? Because there's a conversation that's um, come up quite recently and quite frequently, actually, around geopolitical intelligence, traditional intelligence, very much OSINT level stuff, mm -hmm. um, cyber threat intelligence. And the two teams, when you're usually in an enterprise organization, the clash, because these guys have been around for so long. CTI is new. It's the new sexy kid on the block. Um, and it's uh, they're, they're like taking all the glory and the budget and where in fact, I speak to so many uh, very senior Intel folk who are saying, well, if we combine the two and actually work together with, with one goal, um, yeah. that uh, surely have more benefit than, than, than bashing heads all the time. Do you see that? Or can you, I don't know, have you ever come across that? Uh, constantly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, while I was with iSight Partners and now with the with the client base we, we have now. And again, it's not a judgment, and I know you weren't stating it as a judgment, but it's mm -hmm. organizations grow organically. And because a lot of times it's the nature of the business. When you're looking at a, an extraction firm, whether it's oil and gas or mining, mm -hmm. those are very physical worlds. 
yeah. by definition. So you'll see a stronger physical security team, budget, yeah, priority, the era of the CEO. You look at an e-commerce or a more, uh, cyber's a sloppy way to call it, but you just look at a more digital sort of tech focused digital, yeah. digital tech yeah. company, and you'll see the CIO and the CISO uh, mm. in ascendancy. Uh, and the physical piece may be, you know, the, 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 the weaker member of the team. So that's kind of where we started. When we would go into a client now or with eyesight, you would see that. Uh, to, to the credit of, of some companies, someone in the leadership said, no, no, you guys need to work together. It goes, yep. you know, the, the, the easy example would be is the physical security cameras had open IP addresses. Yeah, you know, yeah. uh, but the cyber guys weren't either required or didn't think about scanning for open ports or to see if they could find the cameras. And the physical security guys maybe weren't even up on what IP or voice over IP meant. Yeah. And so they weren't aware that it was that it was an exposure. So when you started them talking together, then suddenly it's like, oh, yeah, again, and then, you know, budgets – if it was managed right, become a little more integrated and you find efficiencies like um, uh, identity and access control obviously is inside the network, but it's a physical security thing. How do you, how do you make that more efficient? How do you make that a security tool? Whether yeah. it's cyber or physical, you know, uh, but to your point, there's a lot of places where they can merge. And then some, they were just silos, you know, and, yeah. and for whatever reason, the personalities, you know, clashed or, and I will, I will say this sometimes because of the physical security world tend to come from law enforcement and potentially the military. And it is a physical, it's a high touch human skill set. Yeah. It's yeah. not a high touch technology skill set. So sometimes they felt a little out of balance when the guys get in the room and start talking arcs and sparks yeah. um, on, was, on the cyber side. And so it's just like, mm, these guys, you know, and so there's a, if not animosity, there's a little bit of reluctance to, to kind of yeah. try to push that gap. No, yeah. I, I think also, and I broad, I'm speaking very broadly here, uh, is it can sometimes depend on where the company gets their revenue from. Like you said, oil and gas, physical mining companies, uh, online digital e-commerce. It very much depends on them where they allocate budget to. So, yeah, so I think it's an ongoing topic and it will never, there will never be a complete um, or a time where everyone works in full harmony. Um, but uh, I don't think there will be, but, but yeah, interesting nonetheless, I think. Yeah, and I, the closer they will work or coordinate, it, it, will, it will always benefit the client. It's just, just a matter of your role as a vendor, you can only kind of nudge that so much, then yeah. you're, and then you're kind of getting in their, in their yeah. space. But, yeah. but you can bring up examples, and that's what we would do. We would bring up, uh, you know, uh, anonymous examples of how things worked and how they could you know, make them more successful. I mean, tr truly a good vendor, a good partner, their objective is to make the client more successful, the ones they're talking to in the broader corporation. If you're just Absolutely. there to sell your, your widget or your product, uh, yeah. you, you know, you don't have a, you don't have a runway out front. Uh, absolutely. Uh, look, I've kept you long enough. We'll just finish on a couple of points, um, if you wouldn't mind. Um, right. So, uh, one is, um, I'd really love to know from your point of view, any advice for um, professionals looking at creating a CTI uh, provider or a, just a general Intel provider or um, uh, maybe even a vendor? Uh, any particular high level advice that you give? Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, when people first hear it, it sounds like, uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I knew that already. But it's still some things come down to blocking and tackling. Um, Sorry, my dog's in the background. Good. Good for him. Uh, <laughs> no. uh, I, can, I can draw a crowd anywhere. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but I, I would say is whatever business the client is in, and I'm quite serious about this, is it has to resonate with the business, the business leader, your consumer. If you're writing, and I just want to say CTI is a product, however it presents itself. If you're writing to the network operations guy, mm -hmm. it needs to resonate with them. But uh, everything can't just be at that tactical or operational level to stay relevant and to stay funded and to stay as part of that client's 
uh, suite, you need to be talking to business problems. Yeah. Uh, if you're pushing out IOCs, you have to draw that connection and articulate that connection as to why it's going to impact your business. If it's yeah. a patch on an Apache server that, you know, that only runs, you know, an internal email or something, it's like, well, this is not a priority. But if yeah. you, when you articulate this IOC or this exploit or this group is really going to fundamentally impact your business, your revenue generation, uh, then you guys need to focus on it. So, and that's that's a that's a that's a, a space that has to be addressed by I think the, IC, the CTI community is writing for business. They're members of the company, but they're not the you know they're not the business leaders and they don't have P and L responsibilities. So learning how to write to that client base I think is fundamental. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Know your audience for sure. Um, and then lastly, um, I ask everybody this that comes on uh, to, to Trident Talks. Um, Mike, if you weren't in this industry and just Intel in general, um, other than making bamboo fishing rods, um, what, 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 what would you be doing? Talk to us. Tell us about, a bit about you. Uh, you know, a long time ago, a, a mentor uh, said of himself and of me is, I'm always riding to the sound of the guns. So I, I, I love what I'm doing. Uh, my role is different. As I said, you and others are younger, faster, smarter. Uh, but to be engaged in the, in the industry is, is something I very much in, enjoy. Uh, it's, mm. it's my passion. And you have a career at it and you had some success not, not, and, some, and, and a lot of luck. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's rewarding. Now, um, if it was completely outside of the business world, I'll, I'll, I'll reveal that I'm a, a Black Rock Ranger. Um, if anyone's familiar with Burning Man and, and its offshoots around the world, uh, we'll put a link. We'll put a link into the website. Uh, make sure it's uh, it's suitable for the workplace. If you put a Burning Man, link. <laughs> no images. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I love it. Love what I'm doing, and, and hopefully uh, I can continue to to, to be relevant to, to you and the community. Yeah, awesome. Mike, thank you so much. Uh, it's pretty, I think, one of my most favorite uh, episodes we've recorded. Um, I think it's awesome to see the journey. Um, uh, again, obviously, thank you for your service in the military, I didn't say it earlier, um, and through the agency world. Setting up iSight with John and the team and the other guys. And uh, I know you mentioned it earlier, but I know you are super thankful for everyone that joined you on that journey. Um, I know that, right? I can just tell you're that kind of character who... Um, yeah, uh, otherwise we'd go under the radar. Um, but I think it's been awesome. Thank you very much for sharing that journey. Um, I think um, our audience will really, really take a, a lot away from it. Uh, I know there are, there are Intel leaders who, who watch this. There are professionals. There are people just joining the industry at analyst level. Um, so it's something for everyone. So um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. I think you're doing great things. Uh, certainly your, your, your role and your, your position you. is relevant to the community and uh, glad, glad to have the conversation with you and be glad to help anyway. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.